Pentecostal. And let's turn in our Bibles to Isaiah chapter 9. We're looking at Isaiah 9 and 10, Lord willing. Title of our study, A Child, A Son, A Savior. Isaiah 9 and 10, A Child, A Son, A Savior. We're in a section in Isaiah, chapter 7 through 12, that major on the, well, Messiah. There are multiple prophecies that are messianic in nature, and that just means that Isaiah saw the Lord, and the Lord spoke to him, and he talked about how things were going to be when Jesus came first time, when Jesus returns second time. Well, Isaiah 7, we saw it last time. Look at Isaiah 7, 14. It shouldn't be far back for you. It prophesied the miraculous birth and the spiritual nature of our Lord and Savior Jesus. Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and you shall call his name Emmanuel. Emmanuel, of course, means God with us. So, that's who he is and how he came. Well, listen, there's something even more radical and miraculous, and that's going to be the focus of, well, at least these first seven verses here in chapter 9. The latter part of our study last time focused, as this one will, on certain judgment. And I have to say, I much rather... Uh, would share about and preach on and teach on the love of God and the mercy of God and the grace of God and the peace of God. And, but the judgment of God is as real. So we need to be aware of it and we need to understand how it came and to whom it came and well, what we need to do to make sure it never falls on any of us. So here's what happens. We're going to see those passages that we concluded with last time give way to beautiful and glorious promises of a Savior, a child, a son. Well, chapter 9, verse 1, Nevertheless, the gloom will not be upon her who is distressed, as when at first he lightly esteemed the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, and afterward more heavily oppressed her by the way of the sea beyond the Jordan in Galilee of the Gentiles. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in the land of the shadow of death, upon them a light has shined. You have multiplied the nation and increased its joy. They rejoice before you according to the joy of harvest, as men rejoice when they divide the spoil. For you have broken the yoke of his burden and the staff of his shoulder, the rod of his oppressor, as in the day of Midian. For every warrior sandal from the noisy battle and garments rolled in blood will be used for burning and fuel of fire. Now, this isn't even the good part yet, but all of this is still good news. And so what we have here is, well, hope for the days that were coming. He mentioned the judgment, the gloom, the distress that they had been experiencing and under. And then there's this prophecy that there beyond the Jordan, in Galilee of the Gentiles, the people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Of course, this is one of many passages quoted in the New Testament, and it is a, a, a messianic in nature, as so many of them are. And what he's referring to is the fact that Jesus set up his base of operation there around the Sea of Galilee. So if you ever make it to Israel with or without us, well, if you make it with us, we're in the habit of spending five or six days up there in that area of the Sea of Galilee. Why? That's where Jesus set up his base of operation. That's the place he called home during those years. He was calling and training and preparing his disciples. That's the place, those many places around that sea where, well, the Sermon on the Mount takes place there. 
Many of the healings in Scripture take place there. The healing of the, the demoniac there on Gadara, the, the miraculous catch of fish. In fact, his catching those first fishermen to make them fishers of men. All of that and more there on the Sea of Galilee. And what he's saying is because this is in the northern part, and we touched on some of the history last time or the time before, where the kingdom had been divided, the northern tribes, well, they would be dispersed by the Assyrians, displaced by the Assyrians. They would bring in all sorts of Gentiles so that those who did remain in the land, the poor and the meek and the weak, that actually inherited that land in spite of the judgment, well, they ended up intermarrying with the Gentiles, and this made them some kind of second-class you know, religious citizens in the eyes of those who were pure-blooded in Judah. Not just before their own captivity, though you would think that that would have convinced them, well, oh, God sees us all the same. I mean, they went to the Assyrians, we went to the Babylonians. The point I'm making is simply this, that, that Jesus chooses that northern area as a base of operation, not just to fulfill this prophecy, but to do what this prophecy will go on to say he came to do, and that's to expand the kingdom. The Jewish leaders were shrinking it and shrinking it and shrinking it because, well, they were making it more and more difficult to come and worship the Lord. And this passage is going to tell us, no, his plan was to expand them. The prophecy, the promise made to Abraham is that they would be like the sand of the seashore. And they would be like the stars in the heaven as in numbers. So he calls Jesus, and that's the reference here, verse 2, a great light. And he says, those who dwelt in the land of the shadow of death, upon them a light has shined. Jesus comes and says he is the light of the world. We who follow after him will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. You've multiplied the nation. That's a reference to his promise, as I just mentioned, to Abraham. You've increased its joy. Why? In your presence, fullness of joy. He walked in their very midst. He taught there in their synagogues. He, he preached and, and healed and, well, he demonstrated to all who would look on and listen in who he was, that he was like no other. And we'll see why. It will be described beautifully for us uh, just a few more verses down well, he says, they rejoice before you according to the joy of harvest. He says it's like a celebration to be in the presence of Jesus. And also, as men rejoice when they divide the spoil, that's a reference to victory because you divide the spoil after you conquer the enemy. In our case, the enemy isn't physical but spiritual. Unless we're looking in the mirror, then there's a physical enemy and we are him. <laughs> And so uh, you've broken the yoke of his burden, the staff of his shoulder, the rod of his oppressor, as in the day of Midian, every warrior sandal, and this is a promise, a prophecy, every warrior sandal from the noisy battle, verse 5, garments rolled in blood will be used for burning and fuel of fire. Back in chapter 2, there was a promise, I'll read it to you, it's in verse 4, wouldn't hurt to see it. It says, out of Zion, well, this is the latter part of verse 3, out of Zion shall go forth the law, the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He shall judge between the nations and rebuke many people. They shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Now, here's something wonderful about that prophecy. It looks beyond their day, beyond Jesus' first coming 700 years later, beyond the 2,000 years since to a future time in human history, the only time where this could be said to be a permanent situation, where there will be no more war. And that's what we're reading here as well. The garments rolled in blood would be used for burning and fuel for fire. Well, verse 6 then, the heart of our passage will spend a few moments on it, Actually, 
more than a few moments because there's nothing more important that we're going to read and consider tonight than this particular verse. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulder. His name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Peace. He's, we're told that he would be, first of all, a child, and it mentions his birth. That points forward to the reality that we have already considered in Isaiah 7, 14, that he would be born miraculously of a virgin named Mary, and so a child is born. It speaks to the reality of his humanity that Jesus really became one of us. That everything we go through, every trial, every temptation, that, that all of the rejection and encouragement, all of the suffering and, and joy, he experienced it all. He knows what it is to walk in our shoes, to live in our skin, if you will. By the way, have you heard that saying, bite your tongue? You know, you're, have you heard that? Here's a tip. Don't do it. Uh, <laughs> It was an accident, but I did it earlier, and I got to say, enough is with you for a while. <laughs> My caps started coming loose, but no, I'm kidding about the caps. But man, it really was painful, and I don't know why people said, Look, it's like break a leg. If, if you're doing something and they tell you to do that, don't do it. I don't know why people encourage you to such things. Anyway, a child is born. A son is given. This is important because it's a reference to his deity, but not just that he's truly God. No, it's a reference to his pre-existence as the son of God. And so Jesus didn't become the son at the birth he experienced there from Mary. He was always the son of God. There was always a trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. They were always three people. And always one God. Each of them is involved in creation. Each of them involved in sustaining creation. Each of them involved in our redemption. It could never happen apart from any one of them. Each of them involved in our perfection ultimately. Well, so here's the picture. He's going to be a child and he became that. But a son... He was always the son of the father. Well, the government shall be upon his shoulder. That speaks of his rule, his dominion, the idea that, that he would be king of kings and lord of lords, that he will rule and reign forever and ever and ever. There's something else, though. Jesus says at one point, take my yoke upon you and learn of me for I am meek and lowly of heart and you will find rest for your souls the idea is if he's bearing the weight and I'm yoked together with him then it's going to be a much easier walk for me not a, a trouble-free walk because even Jesus faced all sorts of trials and temptations and troubles but one where I'm yoked so closely together with him when I come to the road and I'm not sure which way to go, I won't even have to pray, which way should I go? I'll just feel him leaning right, and I'm yoked, so I'm going. I never want to unyoke from him or, or you know, take off the yoke and say, okay, well, I'm going to just rest here, and I'll meet up with you down the road. You don't want to do that either. Well, his name shall be called. It's important name and scripture. And most of you have tracked with this, unless you're new to all of this. And if you are, know that name re relates to our nature or one's nature, one's character, one's reputation, one's fame. So if you have a good name, that means people speak well of you and, and for good reason. If you have a bad nature or a bad character, bad reputation there's a reason for it well the first will lead to the last 
But his name would be preached and proclaimed and published. And we're still doing that. I'm telling you of all the things we study tonight, nothing's more important than the person and the work of Jesus. It will always be that way. He is called wonderful. And by the way, we're told the common people heard Jesus gladly. Now, I love that. And, and I, I get that that means us for the most part, regular people, not the scholars of the world, the high thinkers or the, the, the famous and, and you know, legends in their own mind, but, but just common, everyday, hardworking, trying to make ends meet and figure things out, raise a family and do your best, just those kinds of people. And when they heard Jesus, they delighted in listening to him. His words were wondrous. No one ever spoke as he spoke. His works were wondrous. Already made mention of some. He cast out demons. He healed diseases. He raised the dead. But more than that, he forgave guilty sinners. Neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. Son, your sins are forgiven you. No one but the Lord can do such a thing, you see. So he's a child and he's a son. His name is wonderful. He, he's the counselor, speaks of his wisdom, his knowledge, his discernment. And why does he have all that? Well, first of all, when he's dealing with us, he actually sees inside of us. Pam and I have been married for so long, she thinks she knows what I'm thinking, but she really doesn't. And uh, I should just let her think she does because she's so happy in that delusion, but I think all sorts of things I would never say to her. And, and it's like if she really knew what I was thinking, she'd be praying more. And, but my point is this. We cannot read one another's mind. No matter how much we know each other. Now, we do often, we'll see something and we'll both say the exact same thing at the same time. That kind of thing happens. And if you've been married a while, I know many of you are, you know that happens. But I'm saying we never get to the point where we can figure the other person out entirely. And here's why. We're always changing. We're not like this person that will be five. And, and that's actually a good thing, by the way, right? Right? As long as the change is for the good, as long as we're getting better, becoming more Christ-like, more merciful, more gracious, more forgiving. She jokes with me. I know she's joking. I hope she's joking. <laughs> she says she really likes the, the, the me that's here. She, she thinks I should invite me to dinner and <laughs> see if I'd want to stay there, you know, with us. And I'm like, you mean there's more than one me? <laughs> And, and she's like, no, I'm just kidding. Or is she? So <laughs> he's the counselor. He sees your heart and mine. He reads our motivation. No one else can judge my intent or yours. In fact, we tend to try to judge people's intentions and motivations, and we're almost always wrong there. And instead of judging other people's intentions, we should judge our own. We should be, say, Lord, give me, be, say, Lord. See that? Now, there's a phrase for you. We should simply say, Lord, show me my own heart. Help me get this right. Help me do this in a way that would please you to do right and do it in the right way. His name will be wonderful, counselor, mighty God. Again, it's a reference to his deity that he is God, that he has power to create, to save, to transform, to destroy. In fact, let me read you Isaiah 43.10. Jot it down or turn over quickly. If you, It's not like you have to look for Isaiah. You just have to find 43.10. You are my witnesses, says the Lord, and my servant whom I've chosen that you may know and believe me and understand that I am he besides me. There was no God formed, nor shall there be after me. I even, I am the Lord, and besides me, there is no Savior. 
Now that has to be spoken of Jesus. That doesn't exclude the Father, who I already mentioned is very involved in our salvation. He so loved the world, he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. The Holy Spirit, no one can come to Christ unless there's conviction of sin, unless someone testifies of him. And listen, that's another thing we're no good at, convicting people of their sin. Oh, we can see it. And we can say, hey, I see what you're doing, and I don't like it, and God doesn't like it, and it's sin. But conviction is something that happens within. That's the work of the Spirit. We're just confronting, and sometimes we have to. One of my least favorite things ever in life to do. But God calls us to do it. If we love, we confront. My point in sharing this is this. He says, I'm the Lord, and I'm the Savior, and there is no other. There was none before, and there'll be no one after and we've shared this a million times. That's probably an exaggeration, but maybe not. Well, lots and lots and lots and lots to infinity and beyond. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by him. He's called here the everlasting Father. And this is confused some because, well, if he's the Son, how can he be the Father? And I've actually read some pretty good explanations, but I think it's simpler than most of those deep thinkers really have figured out. Listen, this is his relationship to time, not to the Trinity. Everlasting Father literally translates Father of Eternity. He is the creator of eternity. He is the reason for eternity. He is the Father of time. And see, listen... We know that this is used of others in Scripture because Satan is called the father of lies. And so uh, he is that, by the way, Satan, a liar and the father of lies. When he speaks a lie, Jesus said, he's speaking his native language because he's always been, well, since the fall, a liar. He lied to himself. He lied to Eve. He lied to Jesus. He lies to us accuses God to us and accuses us to one another, accuses us to ourselves. Well, Jesus, everlasting Father, Father of eternity, and then Prince of Peace. He is the Lord, the Prince. It speaks of his regalness, his position, again, as King of Kings and Lord of Lords. But he is the Prince of Peace. It's through Jesus and only through Jesus we find peace with God. Through his blood shed for us, we can have peace with God. And once there's peace with God, there can be peace within. It speaks of being complete, of being content. And then we can be at peace without. And, you know, security and and, well, not just civility, but blessing people around us. Now, that isn't a description of the culture we're living in, but it can be a description of the many culture within the culture. God has made us a family, made us a body, made us a fellowship. And so all of these things that are true of him, well, we should be dwelling on them, and, and they should be impacting the way we treat one another and the world around us. It says of the increase of his government, there in verse 7, and peace, there will be no end upon the throne of David and over his kingdom to order and establish it with judgment and justice. From that time forward, even forevermore, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. Listen, Revelation 20 speaks of a coming thousand-year rule and reign of Christ on this earth. The reality that he will return and he will establish his kingdom and he'll rule and reign from Jerusalem. That's coming, you see. Before we get there, though, there's going to be, well, I believe the rapture of the church and then the judgment of the unjust, the rebellious, the Christ haters, the Christ rejectors. But even in that judgment, multitudes of people during that tribulation and great tribulation, multitudes come out of that and 
come to the Lord, find forgiveness from the Lord. So these promises, at least of the government and, and you know, the peace and all that good stuff, you know, we don't need weapons because, you know, we're just doing agriculture. That's pretty much not what's happening today. They've not yet been realized. They hadn't yet been realized back then, but they will be realized. But first, the judgment. The Lord, verse 8, sent a word against Jacob, and it's fallen on Israel. He warned the entire nation, and then he talks to Jacob, or to Judah, and to Jacob. Jacob is the father, of course, of the 12 tribes, so so God speaks to him, and then it passes on to the nation of Israel, then at the division. Well, he's dealing with Judah in the south. This prophet, Isaiah, is in the south, ministering to the people in the south, but he's saying, take a look at what's happening up north. And consider how you're dealing with it. Because if you think that you can do what they do and avoid the judgment they're going to soon experience and we're already beginning to experience, man, they were deceiving themselves. So he sent the word against Jacob. It fallen on Israel, his descendants. All the people shall know Ephraim and the inhabitants of Samaria who say in pride and arrogance of heart, The bricks have fallen down, but we will rebuild with hewn stones. The sycamores are cut down, but we will replace them with cedars. And God says, no, you won't. See, their self-confidence would soon be shattered by their destruction, by death, by dispersion, by dilution as the Gentiles, as I mentioned, came into the land brought from other places, displaced and brought in and intermarry. And, and, and that was just one of the many ways that the enemies um, kept control over those people they had overcome. Therefore, he says, verse 11, the Lord shall set up the adversaries of Rezin against him and spur his enemies on. The Syrians before and the Philistines behind. Now, the Syrians were in the northeast and the, the um, Philistines were in the southwest. And he's saying they are going to come up, one from the frontal attack, the other from behind, and they will devour Israel with an open mouth. For all this, his anger is not turned away, but his hand is stretched out still. Now, this is the first of four times this particular phrase appears, and it takes us through the rest of this chapter and then into chapter 10, the first few verses. And each of these conclude a specific aspect of his judgment. So here he's simply speaking of the judgment that is at the door, literally at the door as he uses this phrase. His anger is not turned away. His hand is stretched out still. Now there is something else. Because this idea of of stretching out his hand, I went through, and it's not going to be our study tonight, but that would be an excellent word study for you. Someone wrote me a note saying, what's a word study? Do me a favor. When you ask that, give me an email, and I can respond just to you. Because I don't know what service it was, and and I don't think everybody doesn't know or even cares. And so, uh, but if you want to know what a word study is, it's where you actually, just like you would take a dictionary, except for you get like a Bible dictionary along those lines, and you look at the words that are in Scripture, and you study them. It's that simple. A word study is a study of words. It's half of what we do. It's a historical, grammatical method of Bible study. That's what we're doing. We're looking at the grammar. We're looking at the history, and we're looking for application for our lives. But 65, uh, Isaiah 65, first couple of verses, says, I was sought by those who did not ask for me. I was found by those who did not seek me. And I said, here I am to a nation not called by my name. I have stretched out my hands all day long to a rebellious people who walk in a way that is not good according to their own thoughts. Now that can mean stretching out his hands in judgment. And certainly here in our chapter tonight, that's what it means. But he also stretches out his hands in an offer of peace and redemption. In fact, the best picture you can get of him stretching out his hands would be a hand at each side with nails holding him to a cross. Jesus stretched out his hands 
to redeem us. But, but here he's just saying, look, you already know because we've walked this road. He gave them his law. It was so they'd know these are my standards. This is what righteous living is. This is what I require and desire. And they disregarded and disobeyed it. So he sent them prophets and they disregarded and disobeyed them. So he sent enemies against them. And that's the section we're in. But it was all leading up always to the coming of the one who would redeem them from their sins. That was always in the heart of God, always in the mind of God. Well, chapter 9, back here in our passage, verse 13 says, For the people do not turn to him who strikes them, nor do they seek the Lord of hosts. Therefore, the Lord will cut off the head and the tail from Israel, palm branch and bulrush in one day. Now, I'm intrigued by who he describes as a palm branch because those are meant to bring forth fruit and a bulrush, it's pretty much worthless. He says the elder and honorable is the head. That would be the, the you know, palm branch then. And he who teaches lies, he's the tail. That would be the bulrush. He's saying a prophet that prophesies lies is worthless at best. Worse than worthless at worst. Well, the leaders of this people cause them to err, and those who are led by them are destroyed. The purpose of the chastisement, though, and you have to know this, was their restoration. He was always trying to pull them back. And it's heartbreaking as a pastor or as a parent or a big brother or a big sister who's actually walking with the Lord to watch people that we care for, decide, well, I don't care what the Bible says. People say it doesn't matter. It matters. Well, I don't have to live that way because the grace of God and the blood of Christ, you preach it all the time. Yeah, but Paul warns not to trample on it or dishonor the one who shed it. And so, Therefore, the Lord, verse 17, will have no joy in their young men, nor have mercy on the fatherless and widows, for everyone is a hypocrite, an evildoer, and every mouth speaks folly. Have you ever talked to someone who said, oh, I don't want to go to church, there's just too many hypocrites? Well, by all means, we don't need another one, so they should stay out. <laughs> but the reality is, there are people who are living right and not living right, who are doing right and not doing right, even in our midst tonight. And it's not my call. I don't read hearts and minds. Y'all look nice to me, you know, nice people, nice folks. But, but I know that that's not what God sees. And so it's important that if there's any compromise, any hypocrisy, that when we read words like that, we don't think of others. We're always asking the right question. God, could I be compromised? Would I compromise? Could I become a hypocrite or am I a hypocrite? And if you have confusion about those issues, come and let's talk and let's pray and let's reason together. Well, for all this, his anger is not turned away, but his hand is stretched out still. So he speaks to the reality of those who were leading, that they were leading the people away. Verse 18, the third of the four, the wickedness, for wickedness burns as a fire. It will devour the briars and thorns and kindle the thickets of the forest. They shall mount up like rising smoke. Through the wrath of the Lord of hosts, the land is burned up. And the people shall be as fuel for the fire. No man shall spare his brother. He shall snatch on the right hand and be hungry. He shall devour on the left hand and not be satisfied. Every man shall eat the flesh of his own arm. Manasseh shall devour Ephraim and Ephraim Manasseh together. They shall be against Judah. For all this, his anger is not turned away, but his hand is stretched out still. He is describing not just the rebellion of their day, but the civil strife. It produced as, as tribe was against tribe and, and against nation in the north, against the, the southern tribes, the southern nation in the south. And we should be aware, a house divided, 
according to our Lord, it cannot stand. And he uses that to, to explain why, you know, he wasn't in cahoots with Satan, a crazy accusation at the hand of his enemies. But important to say this, that it's true for our households as well. Our, our natural homes that we're living in and raising families and, and uh, or part of families, true for our church fellowship, a house divided cannot stand. Well, Isaiah 10 begins with woes on Israel's unjust judges. The leaders, he already mentioned them. Now he begins to talk about how they prayed on widows and orphans. Prayed, you know, P-R-E-Y-E-D. Instead of prayed, P-R-A-Y, prayed for and provided for is what they're supposed to be doing. Instead, they were taking advantage of them. Woe to those, verse 1. Chapter 10, and we'll get through this relatively quickie, quickly <laughs> because I'm running out of the ability to pronounce words correctly. No, we'll get through it quickly because it's, it's judgment, 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 maybe oh, a little, little light here and a little light there, but there's a lot of darkness, and I have no desire to dwell in or on the darkness. Woe to those who decree unrighteous decrees, who write misfortune which they have prescribed. They were writing unjust laws and oppressive decrees. What was the outcome? They robbed the needy of justice. By the way, if it were earlier in the night or another night, we could see how all these apply to our current situation in America and to how our lawmakers are doing these very things. But you could have fun with that at home. So... Uh, to rob the needy of justice and take what is right from the poor of my people, that widows may be their prey and that they may rob the fatherless. Hey, God has a special affection for the widow, the orphan, the alien. And so the leaders of their nation were oppressing, writing laws that took advantage of, promising things that they not only couldn't deliver but had no intention of delivering. <coughs> And again, I see far too many parallels in our day. What will you do in the day of punishment, in the day of desolation, verse 3, which will come from afar? To whom will you flee for help? And where will you leave your glory? Without me, they shall bow down among the prisoners, and they shall fall among the slain. Fourth of the four times, for his anger is not turned away, but his hand is stretched out still. Now, in the rest of this chapter, verses 5 through 34, God promises to judge arrogant Assyria. And the reason is sort of surprising if you haven't read it or aren't aware of it. It had to do with their contrasting intentions. You see, God had chosen Assyria, and he's going to describe them, well, in some surprising ways. But their real issue was they were more than happy to do what God had them doing, but they had no desire to please or bless or glorify the Lord. Now you'll read it and make sense of it. Woe to Assyria, the rod of my anger, verse 5. The staff in whose hand is my indignation, I will send him against an ungodly nation. He's talking about Israel there in the north. And against the people of my wrath, he's talking at this point, about his own people who turned away from him. I will give him charge to seize the spoil, to take the prey, to tread them down like mire of the streets. Yet he does not mean so, nor does his heart think so. But it is in his heart to destroy, to cut off, not a few nations. For he says, are not my princes altogether kings? God's mission was clear. It was to turn his people back to him. And when they wouldn't hear the law and they wouldn't hear the prophets, then it was judgment. But the judgment wasn't punitive. It was restorative. The goal was their restoration. The motivation of the Assyrian king and, well, others who would follow in his footsteps, it was their absolute destruction. And that's exactly what he's saying here. It is in his heart, not God's heart, 
to destroy and cut off not a few nations. For he says, are not my princes all the other kings? Is not Calno like Carchemish? Is not Hamath like Arphid? And is not Syria or Samaria like Damascus? As my hand has found the kingdom of the idols whose carved images excel those of Jerusalem and Samaria, as I've done to Samaria and her idols, shall I not do to Jerusalem and her idols? Now listen, this could be from the mouth of the Lord or the mouth of the Assyrian king because God's judging them for their idolatry. Not just that, but that's the primary sin that's grinding him because they're worshiping things, idols made with their own hands instead of the one who made them and blessed them and gave them the land and gave them so much. Who loved them? Justice demands impartiality, you see. God will be impartial in his judgment. Now, apparently the Assyrian king felt he was that too. He's like, hey, those idols of the other nations, they didn't save them. And the little gods you worship aren't going to save you. That's true. The big God, though, who created them and was watching over them would save those who turned to and trusted in him. It's God with a big G, a capital G. Therefore, it shall come to pass, verse 12, when the Lord has performed all his work, on Mount Zion and on Jerusalem, that he will say, I will punish the fruit of the arrogant heart of the king of Assyria. Now, this tells us who this is really be speaking from and who it's spoken of. God's speaking. He says, okay, I'm going to deal with the north. Then I'm going to deal with those in the south, Zion and Jerusalem. You know they're in the southern kingdom. And then he says, I'm going to punish that arrogant heart of the king of Assyria and the glory of his haughty looks. For he says, by the strength of my hand, I've done it. By my wisdom, for I am prudent. And I've removed the boundaries of the people. I've robbed their treasuries and put out the inhabitants like a valiant man. My hand has found the nest of the riches of the people. As one gathers eggs that are left, I have gathered all the earth. And there was no one who moved his wing nor opened his mouth with even a peep. Now, here's what we know to be true. God humbles the proud and gives grace to the humble. And what he's doing is trying to pull his people back. He's saying, man, turn now. Trust now. I already mentioned many would be left in the land. But that would be the humble and meek, the weak among them, those who the enemy didn't see as any threat. But the proud in Israel would go into captivity by the Assyrians. And the proud Assyrian king who thought, hey, this is all about me. God's like, we'll deal with that when we're done with them. So shall the axe, note how he describes, you saw how he described you know, him earlier. Now listen to this. Shall the axe boast against him who chops with it? Or shall the saw exalt itself against him who saws with it? As if a rod could wield itself against those who lift it up, or a staff could lift up as if it were not wood. He's saying, listen, these people, the Assyrians, they're mere tools. They were tools in his tool belt. Now, God used some to bless and others to judge, but only a fool thinks he deserves the glory for either. I know God's called us to bless one another. And, and I want to hear well done, but whether you think it or not, I'm concerned with what he thinks. I want to hear well done from him. And I'm not going to be so foolish as to think, hey, look at what I've done. Because I haven't done nothing except teach his word and preach his gospel. And I've been doing that since the day I got saved. And, and so whatever fruit there's been, that's his fruit. Whatever goodness there is in or through our lives, that's all him. And he deserves all the glory. I'm grateful that he didn't call me to be a, a Jeremiah or a John the Baptist, that my primary ministry is not repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Although I'm sure he said it with a smile, repent, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. I'm grateful that though I'm called to call people to repentance, my focus isn't on you or them, it's on him. His grace, his mercy, his kindness, his patience, his call to repentance, and his desire to bless, not curse, to, to 
you know, broaden our, our, our horizons and, and not well, close us in or judge us for our sin. Well, therefore, verse 16, he begins his conclusion, and he's a preacher because there's still quite a few verses. The, the Lord of hosts will send leanness among his fat ones. So they don't have to worry about dieting. He would take care of that. And under his glory, he will kindle a burning like the burning of a fire. So the light of Israel will be for a fire and his holy one for a flame. It will burn and devour his thorns and his briars in a day. It will consume the glory of his forest and his fruitful field, both soul and body. And they will be as when a sick man wastes away. And the rest of the trees of his forest will be so few in number that a child may write them. And it shall come to pass in that day that the remnant, that's a good word, folks, the remnant of Israel and such shall have escaped the house of Jacob will never again depend on him who defeated them. He's saying, they'll never again turn to their enemy to say, save me from my other enemy. They'll depend on the Lord, the Holy One of Israel, in truth. Listen, here's how God spells success. People turning to him and trusting in him instead of turning to and trusting in whoever else. The politicians, the scientific community, the, the techno technology that we have. Man, if my hope is anywhere, the stock market, the dollar, in God we trust. Yeah, in God we trust, but that piece of paper, not so much. The remnant will return, the remnant of Jacob, verse 21, to the mighty God. For though through your people, though your people, excuse me, O Israel, be as the sand of the sea, a remnant of them will return. The destruction decreed shall overflow with righteousness. The Lord God of hosts will make a determined end in the midst of the land, of all the land. A remnant, he says, will be preserved. A remnant will return. We know that to be reality. Therefore, thus says the Lord God of hosts. By the way, when we look at a remnant, he dispersed them and brought them back. He dispersed them and brought them back. And those people living in Israel today may not all believe in him, and certainly they don't, but they are still there by his hand and by his direction and his will, and he will open their eyes someday in the future. And the Bible says they're going to look on him, Jesus, and say, what's the meaning of these wounds in your hand? So clear will it be in that day who died for them. And he'll say, I received these in the house of my friends. Well, therefore, thus says the Lord God of hosts, verse 24, O my people who dwell in Zion, do you in the manner of Egypt for yet a very little while and the indignation will cease as my anger, will, as my anger and their destruction and the Lord of hosts will stir up a scourge for him like the slaughter at Midian at the rock of Horeb as his rod was on the sea. So he will lift it up in the manner of Egypt. We looked last time at the 185,000 that perished in one night at the hand of one angel. It was Isaiah 37, 36. If you didn't see it, make sure you check it out later. Well... A generation earlier, God extended mercy to humble and repentant sinners in Nineveh. It's so important to get this because when those 185,000 were destroyed, the king's name was Sennacherib. He returned home to Nineveh, to Nineveh, where his sons murdered him to take the throne. But Nineveh, it was, as I just said, but out of order. A whole generation earlier, when another prophet, Jonah, had visited that city, preached, um, you know, God's going to kill you all, and I can't wait. I'm pretty sure that's about how it was going. <laughs> and it never happened because they repented. It's a reminder that God has a heart for all people, and he always judges sin, and he always forgives the repentant sinner. It shall come to pass in that day that his burden will be taken away, verse 27, from your shoulder and his yoke from your neck. The yoke will be destroyed because of the anointing oil. And verses 28 through 31, he simply describes the Assyrians' approach to Jerusalem. 
that would ultimately end in, in failure. He starts up an AI about 10 miles north and then works his way down through some of these cities. We're familiar with some. We don't know at all where they are, but because of time, I want you to look at verse 32 and down to 34, and we'll conclude as yet. He will remain in Nob that day. He will shake his fist at the mount of the daughter of Zion, the hill of Jerusalem. Behold, the Lord, the Lord of hosts, will lop off the bow with terror. Those of high stature will be hewn down, and the haughty will be humbled. He will be cut out of the thickets of the forest with iron, and Lebanon will fall by the mighty one. We began our study. In, in chapter 9, verses 6 and 7, it's the heart of our study. It's the passion of our lives. The one to whom we bow the knee, the one to whom every knee will someday bow and every tongue will confess. Listen, he is a child that was born, a son that is given, the government on his shoulder, his name, wonderful, counselor, mighty God, everlasting father, prince of peace. Lord, thank you for revealing yourself to us, for coming and living among us, for really knowing what it is to be one of us. You endured temptation beyond anything we can imagine because you never yielded to sin. You never engaged in those things that have defiled us and misrepresented you and hurt the people we love most. And Lord, I pray from the youngest to the eldest, that every heart would be set on you tonight, that we wouldn't be hypocrites, that we wouldn't be fools, that we wouldn't be self-deceived, but we would, Lord, see you through the eyes of faith and that we'd recognize you deal justly, that you are a righteous and just God, and yes, merciful and gracious and loving and patient, but you judge rightly and so we don't want to think we'll get by with the sins you've judged others for expose to us those things that have to change in us then have your way as we offer ourselves tonight and if you're here and you've never given your life to the lord jesus the message is straightforward you're a guilty sinner he's a holy god the wages of sin is death the gift of God, everlasting life through Jesus Christ our Lord. The only way you find life, life eternal, life abundant, is in the person of Jesus who gave his life so you could have life. And if you've never said, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I turn from my sin and I trust in you. I want what, what I know you died to give me, life, hope, peace, joy. I want to be the person you created me to be, and I know I can never make that happen. So I give you me so you can make it happen. Anyone this evening, this hour, if you've never done it and you're ready tonight, I'd ask you to raise your hand and hold it high. I'll acknowledge you. I'll pray for you, pray with you. And the miracle takes place within you, within your heart. If you say, God, be merciful to me, he will. Forgive me every sin, he will. Be my Lord and Savior, he will. Anybody at all? Lord, we're so grateful. And we give you all the glory for every good thing. And we take responsibility for everything else. I ask you to make us those men and women, those boys and girls you created us to be. In Jesus' name, amen.